God is not, Brother Copeland said this about Brother Robert's vision. I thought it was so good. Brother Copeland said, God's not running out of mercy. He's running out of time. And we're running out of time. And we have to have our leaders. We saw how God anoints kings. The Lord showed us how he anoints military. And so he's in the business of anointing. And we're going to work with him. And today, I thought that was just right, Terry. Praise God. You may be seated. Terry called me one day from California. She well, had been in two days, just a, quite a shape. And she'd been carrying Brother Hagen. And she said, I saw him fall. She called her husband, who has quite an executive position with a, he's not with that company any longer, but with another. And uh, she called him home from work called her son and it wasn't long till I heard that Brother Hagen had fallen uh, down the steps but I tell you right now he lived over it he wasn't that bunged up we had him several more years with no broken limbs and I tell you somehow God cushioned that fall through the prayers of these people and that's that's what we're about. Now, I have uh, been given the... Uh... Now, this does not include pledges. Is that right? No? Not including the pledges. It does include pledges. So you don't have... Um... Okay. But I am so thankful to the Lord... I'm up doing announcements because Chip got a telephone call last night from his wife who went home that their basement was flooded. So at 3.30 this morning, he was pulling leaves from the gutter and other things, but, uh, but he's here. He's sitting right there. He's just a little sleepy. <laughs> and, uh, and then Shelly had a physical attack in the nighttime, and they had both, you know, they jumped out there and made a pledge, stretched themselves. I want to pray right now over everybody's finances, not let the devil steal from anybody. Stand up right now. He's just a thief, and he's not going to steal. We're not letting him steal. So right now, I want to pray in the name of Jesus for everybody who gave last night in any time in this offerings, and for everybody who made a pledge I plead the blood of Jesus over everything they own. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Satan, you are not going to be able to nibble away at their finances. In fact, they have sown according to the law of sowing and reaping, and they're going to have super abundance to give. They've blessed Israel. You have shown your hand here, and we have stopped it off and cut it off at the beginning. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, praise the Lord. You may be seated. And you'll notice as you look around that there is on your um, chair this with Keith Butler's name on it. Now, we have out here at our tables, every one of our guests have a table, and you can sign up and be a partner of Lynn Hammond. You can sign up and be a partner of Kenneth Copeland Ministries. I highly recommend it. Keith Butler, who pastors a church of how many, Keith? Just come up here just a minute, if you don't mind, and bless the Lord. Have we got a, uh, a microphone for Keith? Keith uh, is Bishop Keith Butler. And um, Bishop, as Bishop, what does that entail? For those of us who might not know. Well, I oversee hundreds of ministers and churches uh, across the world. Uh -huh. And uh, so I'm their overseer. That's why they call me Bishop. And your church in Detroit is your home church? That's the headquarters church. Headquarters right. church, and that's how many members? 21,000. 21,000 members. <laughs> then you have a, a church that your, oh, his son is so able. I went up and did a conference 
prayer conference at their place before I went to uh, Israel in the spring. And I'm telling you, if I was ever impressed by a young man, it's Deborah and Keith's son. And so he pastors for you in uh, Atlanta. In the Smyrna, Georgia area. In Smyrna, Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, in Atlanta suburb. In the Atlanta suburb. And then your church in, you have Arizona. Uh, all the way from California to Pennsylvania to South Texas to and Little to, America, and, Europe, other places, right? And to Lebanon. I mean, excuse me, London. London, yeah. Hope I wasn't prophesying something for Lebanon. Whatever God wants. That's all right. You wouldn't be afraid to go. I can tell you that right now. I've been that part of the world. Now, yeah. uh, Keith was, is a graduate of Rhema Bible Training Center. He went there in 1978. And um, he's had a wondrous life. And the Lord called Keith into a civic government uh, in the city of Detroit. And he served there. And amazing things happened, happened while he was there. And now... The Lord is calling him back again. And so, uh, anyway, uh, he might run for dog catcher. Don't catch any little nice border collies, though. We used to have a border collie that the dog catcher was always after. So if you'd like to sign up on our mailing list, there is a, um, right here, or I, I didn't get one, but in the offering card, there's a place where you can say, we want to be on the mailing list. And I'm sure there is a place on Gloria's table, and there is a place on the other tables of the speakers. Now, uh, Brother Keith, we didn't give him a table. So if you wanted to be on his mailing list, you could sign it up there. Uh, from your seat. Is that good enough? Bless the Lord. And um, so, Brother Keith's mailing list. And so when we receive the morning offering, you could pass those to your right. And then the ushers on the right will pick them up. Bless the Lord. Thank you very much. Now, I wanted to uh, invite my little friend Gloria to the platform. And she's going to um, receive our morning offering, and then she's going to help me introduce our guests, our speaker guests this morning. And I, I, I thought this morning, oh, my goodness, we have got such a big budget for this meeting, and the people have given so much. Don't and think. Don't, don't think. think. <laughs> but guess what? The budget's met. <laughs> Woo! The budget is already met. Glory to God, I'm so thankful to the Lord. I am the least likely candidate for God to give big projects to. Because you don't worry about it. I don't worry about them at all. So it works. So I guess it works. But praise the I know it works. Bless the Lord. But I wanted to say to you that yesterday our offering for REL, the town, the city where the young people are from, was $38,723. Now, you watch the news, and when you watch the news, you watch for Ariel because it figures greatly in the news, and now you're tied to it. And we need to pray, Billy, for them to not be put out of their place. Yes, we do. We're going to... Now, we're especially tied to that place in the West Bank. Yes, we are. We are especially tied. We're, I mean, we're right in there. When you give your money into something, you're into it. Now, um, I wanted to um, say here that... Um, our morning offering yesterday for McDowell was $60,417. Now, Living Word has already given $250,000, and their pledge is $750,000. And with their pledge, and what was pledged and given last night, our total was, is, including Living Word, $2,185,984. Gave nine thousand.
$1,000. Praise God. They found the donation button. Are you standing up cheering out there? Wherever you are in all those countries that they gave me the names of, including Saudi Arabia? In the I'm camp. telling you, I am blessed. I'm blessed. And I know that he does super abundantly above. He's done it. He's doing it. You want to come over on the tour where we turn the shovel? Okay. We'll be turning the shovel soon there in Ariel. We've got it all cleared. That took quite a lot of money to get those buildings down and all that stuff hauled off. They said they had several trucks in a row and the whole city of McDowell was watching that parade of those trucks. <laughs> Bless the Lord. And so I've asked Gloria if she would receive the morning offering and then stay uh, to help me introduce the guests. Okay, great. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Woo, that is so good. Money's flowing in the body of Christ. This is the year of fullness. And next year's a year of overflow. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, Brother, uh, Brother Hagen prophesied about, uh, Ken has prophesied about the year of fullness being 2004. Brother Hagen said it's the year for more. So that's an agreement. And uh, then in 2005, Ken prophesied the year of overflow. And Brother Hagen prophesied the year of judgment. Well, if you don't know exactly how to decipher and make those two agree, I'll tell you. Judgment is not bad if you don't have to be judged. <laughs> if you've already judged yourself, you won't be judged. And if you haven't already judged yourself, now would be a great time to consider that <laughs> and get things in line that need to be put in line. So if you're judged righteous, what are you in line for? Overflow. Overflow. If you're, and, and that would be overflow in good and wonderful things. But if you're judged and you're outside the will of God and you're not walking in the wisdom of God and honoring God in your life, what would that mean? It would still be overflow. But it would be overflow in the wrong direction. In other words, things are coming down to a point. And uh, for, for you that are walking with God, and most of you are, you wouldn't be in this crazy place with us. <laughs> then you can expect good and fullness and greatness and overflow then in 2005. And then we all know what Brother Hagin said about 2006, but we all like to hear it again. He said, it's going to be so good. It's, oh, 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 it could not be told. Now, Billy and I, and I'll just take a show of hands, we're convinced that we're close, Amen. that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And that's what he, he told Brother Roberts in that vision. And he said, the church is not ready, the Jews are not ready, and the nations are not ready. But now we can be ready if we choose to be. And so we feel like it's time to just pull out all the stops and go for God and don't let anything be in your life that's dark. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And all will be well with you. I heard somebody say this the other day, and I don't even know who it was, but I thought, I don't remember to do that. They said, every day when I wake up, I say, all is well. That's a great thing to do. All is well. All is well. How does it get well? It gets well because you walk in the wisdom of God. Now, I'm going to try not to preach up here today too much. But there's a couple of things. I, I want to read some scripture and Proverbs to you. And I want to talk to you about your seed. People planted great and wonderful and abundant seed last night. And I want to read something that I heard Brother Robert say about that. But in Proverbs 3, if you want to just listen, if you don't have an amplified Bible, just to give you a quick... A quick overview. We're, we're talking about prosperity, and prosperity comes through wisdom, godly prosperity. 
Now, now, prosperity out there in the world can come through crime or whatever, but that's just money. It's not really a prosperous life. It's just, it's money. But the more evil you are and the more money you have, the sooner you'll kill yourself. So it's not good. It's who has the money that depends on what kind of good or bad it is. Now, if you're sold out to the Lord and you've got money, you can do things like Bill McDowell and do all those things. But if you're sold out to darkness, then you're going to use your money in ways that will cause you to die young. Walking in sin will cause you to die young. And that's why we see so many people in entertainment and sports that make a lot of money. And the more they make, the, the quicker they kill themselves or get themselves in trouble. Because money just follows the one who has it. If you're good, your money's good. You'll do good with it. And so I want to just read these scriptures, and I'll try not to comment on them too much, about the wisdom of God. Riches, we know from the scripture, comes through wisdom. That is the way to prosper. You can prosper in the world. You can prosper in evil as far as money is concerned. But if you want to live a good life, and you want things to be well with you, this is the only way to really prosper in the Word of God, the wisdom of God. As Ken and I found out what God's Word says, we begin to prosper. And we have walked in it for a long time. And we are still increasing. It's so exciting to continue to increase. You don't ever, if you don't quit, God won't quit. But if you quit using your faith, if you quit sowing your seed, if you keep quit tithing, giving, then you're, you know, you're just going to slow down and sooner or later you'll go backwards. But if you'll keep going in just the same fervor that you did when you didn't know how you were going to buy groceries, then you'll just continue to prosper and prosper and increase and increase and increase because you're walking in the wisdom of God. You know, a lot of people come to God in crisis. We were in a money crisis. Uh, ever since before we got married, we were in a money crisis. Ken had been in a money crisis longer than I have because he's older than I am by five years. So he'd been in one five years longer at least. <laughs> I was just barely getting started in my money crisis. But he, he was well going. And so... We were in a money crisis. Some people come to the Lord in a sickness and disease crisis. But wherever you begin to seek the Lord, whatever it is, you'll get help. You'll get healed. You'll begin to learn how to prosper. So the Lord, our problem was that, so he began to teach us how to prosper. Now, a lot of years have come and gone. We've done a lot of things that God told us to do. Big things, wild things, you know, way out there. And we have found that every dream you have that God gives to you, and you wouldn't want any other kind of dream, whether it's just a personal blessing or it's ministry or buildings or, or uh, equipment, we have found that whatever you believe and so far and follow up with the wisdom of God, your giving's not going to work supernaturally if you're living in the dark. You've got to get it all together, which is what? Wisdom, the way God does things. And so I'm going to read you these scriptures. We found, though, that it will come to pass. We have never gone after anything, big, little, that didn't come to pass. Now, you know, we've got things we're working on right now, but not too many. But all the other things up to this point, and you'll see soon, you'll see what the thing we're working on right now, the big project, you'll see it come to pass. See, God doesn't quit if we won't quit. And I want to tell you, don't lay your dreams down. Don't quit. You say, well, I'm not getting anywhere. Well, just go after more wisdom. And, and, and believe God when you sow a seed. And stay with it. I'm going to read you that in just a minute. Okay, here we go. In Proverbs 3, I'm going to read in the Amplified Bible. It says, in verse 4, well, I better go to verse Let's just start with one. My son, forget not my law or teaching, but let your heart. Now that's a very important word, your heart. It's not a head thing. Let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days, what are his commandments? That's his wisdom. 
length of days and years of a life worth living. You should live a long life, at least 120 years according to the Word of God. Years of a life worth living and tranquility, inward and outward, continuing through old age till death. So do we, do, does it all stop when we get to be 70 or 80 or 90 or 100? No, as long as you're here, you should be blessed and you should have length of days and tranquility till old age, uh, through old age, till death, until you leave here. And then you really got it made. These shall they add to you. So if you're getting older, and some of us are, you know, if you're getting older and you're thinking, well, it's time for me to slow down and quit and... And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know what I'm going to do for my, you're, the Lord has provided for you for 70 or 80 or 100 years. You think he's going to quit now? No, he's faithful. If you're faithful, he's faithful. Don't even think about it. Think about, I'm going to live long. I'm going to live strong. I'm going to be prosperous. I'm going to do the will of God until I leave this place and give God glory in my life. Oh, I wasn't supposed to preach. All right. Uh, receive instruction in wise dealing and discipline of wise thoughtfulness and righteousness and justice and integrity, that prudence may be given to the simple, so this works for all of us, and knowledge, discretion, and discernment to the youth. The wise also will hear and increase in learning, and the person of understanding will acquire skill and attain to sound wisdom so that he may be able to steer his course rightly. Riches and honor come through wisdom. Well-being in life comes through wisdom. Finding out what God says about a thing and doing it. Let's see, let's skip down to seven. The irreverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is the beginning and the principal choice and part of knowledge. Its starting point, its essence. But fools despise skillful and godly wisdom and instruction and discipline. My son, hear the instruction of your father and forget not the teaching of your mother. Now look at chapter 3. My son, forget not my law or teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of a life worth living, inward and outward and continuing through old age, these shall add to you. Let not mercy and truth Whoops, I missed a page. Let not mercy and kindness uh, forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Write them upon the tablet of your heart. So shall you find favor. If this chapter didn't tell us anything but that we'd find favor through the wisdom of God, we would know we have it made. When God favors you, I've been praying in, in certain situations, you know, for God to favor that man. Favor him. Favor him. Give him favor. God, you can't resist the favor of God. The favor of God can't be resisted. So shall you find favor, good understanding, and high esteem in the sight of God and man. When you walk in the wisdom of God, even if a man around you doesn't like it, he can't help but respect you and admire you for it. And really, our lives ought to make everybody that doesn't know God want to know God. Yeah. Lean on, trust in, be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all, what do we do? We rely on His wisdom instead of our understanding, our experience. What happened the last time I gave? It didn't seem like I got anything. Well, you quit. You know, Brother Hagin used to say, God doesn't settle up every Saturday night. And that is a deep, deep teaching. God doesn't settle up every Saturday night, but He settles up. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct and make straight and plain your path. So we'll know what way to walk. Be not wise in your own eyes. This is a key right here to walking in goodness and blessing and all the things God's got for you. Be not wise in your own eyes, reverently fear and worship the Lord, and turn entirely away from evil. If you want to walk in the blessing 
And the blessing is so tremendous, it covers everything in your life, your health, your wealth, your family, your everything. You turn away entirely from evil. If there are things in your life that are hanging on, get rid of them in this meeting. There's power here in this meeting. Don't let things keep you pulled down into the darkness. Uh, the, the wisdom of God's not going to be able to provide you riches and honor and health and wealth and all the good things if you don't obey what wisdom says. So here's what wisdom says. Turn entirely away from evil. We live in an evil generation. I'm shocked at how evil this generation is. If you've lived very long, you remember when things were not done that are being done now. Right there on your television set, you'll flip through and see things that you think, I must be having a nightmare here. <laughs> the days are evil, but we don't have to participate. We've been delivered from it. We're righteous. We're the righteous. It shall be health. The wisdom of God shall be health to your nerves uh, uh, and sinews and marrow and moistening to your bones. So here's our health. Honor the Lord with your capital and sufficiency and with the first fruits of all your income. We tithe and we give. And that's where our increase comes from. So shall your storage places be filled with plenty and your vats shall be overflowing with new wine. Storage places filled with plenty. Be, be, just be seeing your bank account, your savings account, whatever it is you've got your money in. See that it is overflowing. See it overflowing with plenty. Don't settle for less than what wisdom says is yours. Glory to God. So shall your storage places. If you just have enough, you don't need any storage places. This says storage places. See your storage places. Glory to God. This says, so shall your storage places be filled with plenty. Now, we, if we don't believe for that, we're not walking in wisdom. Because here's wisdom saying this is ours if we'll honor the Lord with our capital and sufficiency. See ourselves with that. Uh, my, uh, my son, despise not or shrink from the chastening or the discipline or the correction of the Lord. Neither be weary or impatient about or abhor his reproof. There is nothing more precious to you in life than the correction of the Lord. If the Lord just led you out there, left you out there going in the wrong direction, you're going to hit the wall. So he corrects you. Well, he instructs you. He, he disciplines you. I mean, he's not putting leprosy on you. He's, he's endeavoring to get you to find out the wisdom of God and make a change. So it's a wonderful thing. I just thank the Lord all the time. Every day I thank him for correcting me. It's one of the privileges of my life that he won't let me go, continue to go in a wrong direction without talking to me about it. So be quick to change and quick to repent. Happy, look at verse 13. Well, it says, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as the Father corrects his, the Son in whom he delights. So it's our honor to be corrected. Happy, blessed, fortunate, enviable is the man who finds skillful and godly wisdom and the man who gets understanding, drawing it forth from God's Word. That's where we get it. The Lord didn't leave us out here just to to have to get it all on our own, just absolutely by vision or a dream. No, he gave us the written word so that there is no excuse for us to walk in darkness. Happy, blessed, fortunate is the man who finds skillful and godly wisdom and the man who gets understanding, drawing it forth from God's word. For the gaining of it is better than the gaining of silver and the profit of it better than fine gold. Silver, uh, skillful and godly wisdom is more precious than rubies. And nothing you can wish for is to be compared to her. Does the Bible ever lie? Does it exaggerate? It says nothing you can wish for can be compared to her. And here's why. Length of days is in her right hand. Long life, in other words. And days of a life worth living, we read earlier. And in her left hand are riches and honor. If you've got wisdom, you've got uh, length of days, and you've got riches and honor. Wisdom, length of days, and riches and honor, that's just about all there is to a good life. 
Glory to God. Her highways, wisdom's highways, are highways of pleasantness, and all of her paths are peace, and that word is shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who hold, lay hold on her, and happy and to be envied is everyone who holds her fast. What would have happened in the garden if they'd have eaten of the tree of life? Nothing. It would have still been great. The garden would never have had to, to go dark or to be closed off to them. They would still be in the garden, only it would have covered the whole world by now. The whole world would be a garden. Glory to God. So the tree of life, wisdom is the tree of life. That's saying a lot to you. The Word of God is as the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. And here's why. By skillful and godly wisdom has the Lord founded the earth, and by understanding He has established the heavens. The earth is, is founded on wisdom. The heavens are established on wisdom. When you and I walk in wisdom, which is the way God does things, we prosper. Riches and honor and all the peace of God with it. Now, riches and honor are one thing, but riches and honor with peace, with shalom, that is something big. Glory to God. So we, God has prosperity for us through, rich, through wisdom, riches and honor and shalom through wisdom, hallelujah, the way God does things. Now I want to read to you, that's just a, a, a word about really how to prosper. The more you know about the book and do it, the more you're going to prosper. The, and, and you have to walk with faith. You have to believe it in there. You can't read it one moment and say the next moment, what am I going to do? They're going to repossess my house. No, you have to be tough. You have to have tough, you've heard of tough love? Well, you've got to have tough faith and stay with it in the hard places. That's when you really need it. Now, uh, Brother Roberts, now I'm going to say this over your seat and then we're going to pray. And believe God, you be, you be listening for what the Lord wants you to do in the offering. I, I heard he and Evelyn in, in 2004, we, Ken and I had already gone, but we saw it on tape. He, he and Evelyn sat down. This is the minister's meeting they have. They sat down on the platform, and they began to talk about their life and how God had moved in their lives, how, how he had blessed them, how in their young uh, when they were young in the ministry and they went to work at this church and, and uh, there was not a parsonage and they had to go live with people, with their children. They had to take their children in somebody else's little house for months and months and months. And Evelyn fr finally said to Oral, she said, Oral, if you don't get me a house, I'm going to take these children and I'm going to go back to mother until you get one. Well, Brother Roberts, he likes to have Evelyn with him. <laughs> and he went the next night to the church, and he, took an, uh, he received an offering and for a parsonage. And he said, I'm going to start this offering off. And he put his entire salary in that offering, which was not very much, but it was all he had. And so people began to give and so on. And he got a certain amount of money. He went home. Then Evelyn didn't go to the meeting. He went home and he told her what about it. She said, Oral, how much did you put in it? He said, I put our whole paycheck in there. Oral, you didn't put our whole paycheck in there. I'm telling you, he was desperate. He didn't want her to leave. And oh man, she, she you know, he, he said it had never, there had never been a, something to this effect. There had never been a winter Oklahoma night as cold as that one was. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there are icicles formed inside the house, you know, so to speak. And he felt terrible and she was upset. And what are we going to do? We, can't, we don't have money for groceries. You know, I can understand her feeling. I probably would have done the same thing. And uh, so here was a cold, cold night, he said, there in Oklahoma. Then at about 4 o'clock in the morning, there came a knock on the door. And they had to have something like $400 or something to get in that house. It wasn't very much, but it was like 
majored back then. And uh, the guy, that's, this guy came knocking on the door, and I think he was a farmer, if I remember right. And he said, Brother Roberts, the Lord got me up in the middle of the night. Now, I'm telling you, Brother Roberts, you know, was doing some desperate praying. He was in trouble before he went to church. Now he's in double trouble. The guy knocked on the door, and he said, the Lord got me up in the middle of the night. And he said, I went out in my yard, and I dug up this money. He, he, had, he buried his money in the yard. He dug up this jar full of money. And it was 400 and something dollars. It, whatever the amount was, it was that amount or maybe just a little over. He brought it to him in the middle of the night. Got him out of bed. He went out in the cold and dug it up. God got him. You know, Rufus Mosley says God can get a, make it hot enough to get a move on anybody. <laughs> and I thoroughly believe that. He got that man up. He got that money to Oral. And Evelyn said, Oral, what was it? He said, it was so-and-so, and he brought some money. Well, how much was it? And he told her, and she could hardly believe that had happened. But it was just more than enough. So, and, and they, and I wasn't going to tell you that story, but it's just such a wonderful story. Anyway, that same day, he said these things about seed faith, and I'm just going to read my notes because I understood, I think, seed faith more that day than I ever had. He said, God, and I want you to think about your seed last night. It's an important seed. If God led you to put money in that last night, he's, he's, he did it because... For one thing, he wants this project done. For another thing, he wants your project done. He wants your life to expand. He's got something for you. He's trying to increase you. God has put life in a seed. This man was a farmer. In fact, this man is the man that caused Brother Roberts to get the, mirror, uh, the revelation of seed faith because he said to him, and I can't repeat it exactly, but he said to him something like, I'm a farmer. And I know, and he was about to lose his uh, farm or something serious like that, his house or something. And he said, I'm a farmer, and I know that when you plant seed, you get a crop. That's where Brother Roberts learned it, from this man in the middle of the night. So think about what that did when he put his paycheck down there. That opened the door for the revelation of seed faith to come into the body of Christ. And back there then, people were not, they didn't know anything about giving. People were so tight-fisted, they couldn't even figure out how to loose a finger off that grip, you know. <laughs> Think about what he did when he took that bold step of faith. Many of you last night took a bold step of faith. We'll be expecting some bold results. Seed faith revelation came into the body of Christ through his obedience doing that. So you never know what's tied to the end of an act of faith. It might just seem something simple to you, and yet your whole future, the whole plan, the whole shining path that God has for you may be tied to your obeying Him in whatever direction He told you to do. He said, God, ha uh, the gift, here's what we have to remember. We can't give in remorse. We're joyful, cheerful givers, right? That's what the Bible says. God, ha uh, the gift has to be out of faith and not duty. You know, it's everything with God is hard. It has to be out of your heart. Everything has to be out of your heart with God to count. Uh, it has to be, uh, the gift has to be out of faith and not duty. To be seed that has life out of faith, out of your heart. Wrap your faith around that seed, not a duty, but a seed. This offering I'm giving today and the offering that we gave last night, it was not a duty, it was a seed. Now, Brother Roberts has proven that seed faith will produce magnificent things. He got the city of faith built. I mean, he actually got it built. And now I think it was something like $360 million. And that was even a bigger amount then than it, was, than it is now. He got it built. Now, people didn't come to it, but he got his job done. He and the Lord did their part. I'll tell you what, the body of Christ would be so much better off today had they continued to support the city of faith. Uh, it says, wrap your faith around that seed, not a duty, but a seed. The keys to seed faith. One, God is my source. 
Look to him as the one who brings harvest and not to man. Malachi 3. But number two is sow the seed in faith. And number three is expect a harvest, or in other words, stay in faith after you sow the seed. Don't get cold feet after you've sown the seed. The seed has been sown. You can't get it back. You stay in faith. Amen. And don't say, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to get that money? No. Sow in faith and expect a harvest. Or in other words, stay in expectancy. Stay in faith. He said, give out of your need. Sow the seed against the need. I thought that was good. Sow the seed and look to God. He's the one that brings the harvest. And then he said this. If you don't support the pastor, he can't be a role model to you. Brother Roberts felt as a pastor that he couldn't lead his people into prosperity since he wasn't practicing that himself. He said, after reading the New Testament many, many times, he let John, uh, 3 John 2 in, and it was, which is, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, which was a real revelation to the body of Christ in those days. Prosper, they just sort of looked over and health they kind of thought about. But Brother Roberts, one man in God, changed that forever in the body of Christ. He put in, he, he started the body of Christ looking for increase and in seed faith and prosperity. And he caused them to change their idea about God and sickness and disease. God is not the source of sickness and disease. Sow the seed, look to God. If you don't support the pastor, he can't be a role model to you. After reading the New Testament... He let, uh, many, many times, he let 3 John 2 in, and it was as if he saw it for the first time. Evelyn, when he told Evelyn, she didn't even think it was in the Bible. (laughs) That we prosper and be in health. God wants us to prosper and be in health. And he got the revelation of it, and he changed. He and God, he did what God wanted him to, and he changed the idea about money and health in the body of Christ. Think about that. You know, when I was a little girl, my grandmother had, Oral Roberts was on there one day, and I probably was about five years old, and why, I even remember this, I don't know, but our people didn't believe in miracles or anything else much. And uh, so, uh, she said that, and I was just a little kid, but it stayed with me. He pays people to say that. You know, they were saying they were healed. So as a little kid, I didn't think much about it. I thought, wonder what he pays them, five dollars? (laughs) Ten dollars? So then, this was a recent testimony of his, and he said he was recently disappointed because someone didn't follow, quote, a labor, a laborer is worthy of his hire. And the Lord told him, I've got more money than he does. In other words, forget about it and look to me. That is a key to your increase. When things don't go well, when people don't do right, when they... They disappoint you in one way or the other, and they say, you know, I'm going to send you $5 million on Monday, and you never hear from them again. Remember this. I've got more money than he does. People are not our source. God uses people, but they're not our source. God's got the money. He's got the bucks. It all belongs to him, and he can give it to whomever he gets ready to. And I'll tell you this. He is not a man that he should lie, and he will figure out a way to get whatever you believe for and you stay in faith for. Forget about it when problems come, when things come to say you're not going to get it, when the the bill collector comes and you still haven't gotten the money yet. Don't quit. Put it aside. Stay on your faith. Forget about it and look to the Lord. Now you get your offering ready today. We're going to receive it and pray, and you just do what the Lord says to you, and everything will be right in your life, and everything will be right in this ministry. God moves on people, and you have been generous, and you have got a great return and a great harvest coming. So get your offering ready. I'm going to pray over it while it's still in your hands. Lord, we just thank you for where you've brought us thus far. We thank you, Lord.
for the goodness that you've already revealed to us in this life. Oh, my, my, my. Thank you that we're born again. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for pulling us out of the darkness. Thank you for filling us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you for all of the prosperity, for every dollar you've put into our hands, Lord. We receive it as, uh, as harvest and blessing from you, and we give you all honor and praise. And we pray today, Lord, over the offering. I pray over every person that's given anything into this meeting during this week, and I believe God with them, and I agree with them that they have planted a seed, a good seed, and good ground. And it shall come forth abundantly, a hundredfold, at least a hundredfold harvest off that seed. We know, Lord, you believe in big crops. We know that in the, in the blessing when their crops were to be blessed to such a degree that they would have too much crop and they'd have to store it somewhere. So they had to have storage places. And we, Lord, lay hold of that, and we believe. And I speak the word over every seed. I command every seed that is sown in this meeting to take life, to go into good ground of this ministry and bring life and give life, Lord, to take life and for the people's prosperity in their health and in their, in their finances, Lord, to prosper, that they prosper, that they increase, that they, their healing is manifested that their desire financially is manifested. Whatever they're believing for, homes, vehicles, ministry tools, whatever it is, Lord, businesses, we speak the blessing of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command your seed to be blessed and to prosper and to come forth 100-fold in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Now, you've got to water that seed. You've got to keep speaking words over that seed. Never regret a seed. Don't, if the devil comes to you and says, well, you gave that $1,000 and you're going to need it. You tell him to shut back and get back in his cage where he belongs. <laughs> shut up. Get back in your cage where you belong. I bind you. If you bind somebody, can't you, doesn't that the same thing as putting them in a cage? <laughs> Glory to God. Don't listen to it. The seed's been planted. That's not the time to get cold feet. It's already been planted now. So don't listen to doubt. Don't listen to unbelief. Get the word. Read about wisdom. Read about riches and honor. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Lord, we give you praise. We thank you for every seed. And we thank you for every harvest. Glory to God. To all glory goes to the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, that you have prospered us. Get up on your feet and thank the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have prospered us thus far and that we will continue to increase and to prosper as long as we are in the earth. And then, Lord, we'll really prosper. We'll really know prosperity. Glory to God. And we give you the praise. Thank you for manifestation. Thank you for this is the year of fullness. There's still time left in this year. Thank you for fullness and thank you for overflow. Thank you for harvest. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Praise you and bless you and worship you. Lynn says, command the billion flow. Sounds good to me. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we as representatives of the body of Christ, we command the billion flow to come. Come billion flow. Come billion flow. Come billion flow. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Mighty increase. Overflow, overflow, overflow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, let's say that three times together. Let's say, come, billion flow in the name of Jesus. Okay, one, two, three. Come, billion flow in the name of Jesus. Come, billion flow in the name of Jesus. Come, billion flow in the name of Jesus. Now, say. Right.
Christ. Three times. Come into the body of Christ. Come into the body of Christ. Come into the body of Christ. Body of Christ. Hallelujah. 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 And so the ushers will receive the offering. You may be seated. And we are going to um, pass down your... If you'd like to be on Keith Butler's mailing list, pass it down to the right. Anna and Dale, are you here? Anna, are you prepared to sing now? Do they have your background tape? You don't have a background tape. You sing without it. Come on up, baby. Come on up, Dale, just a minute. She's going to sing for us during our offering. Bless the Lord. Come on up, Anna. Now, we're going to be looking today toward the supernatural. We're going to be looking today toward God wants to move in the supernatural. This is Brother Dale Smith and... His daughter, Anna, do you want him to play for you or not? You do want him to play for you. Go over there and get a key while I start to talking to Dale. Do we have a microphone for Dale? She's, do we have a microphone for Dale? Right here, right where? I, I don't see it. But. Oh, okay, there. Bless the Lord. Pastor Dale Smith from, um, actually, what do you say, Gold Coast? From the Gold Coast. Come up here, Dale. Uh, from the Gold Coast in Australia. And uh, we had the blessing uh, to be, uh, and Dale put together a meeting. I mean, he had the Gold Coast ready when we got there. This man is anointed, and we had miracles at that meeting. Tell a little bit about it, Dale. And he shakes under the power of God, so don't uh, fall <laughs> off. Don't fall off. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, we had miracles, and... Uh, and they're, uh, they continue to hap happen too. When I um, came over here last year, and that was a month after uh, Billy was over in, uh, in Perth, I went back and uh, went back, and the first time I was in the Sunday morning service, uh, I just uh, sensed that there was a powerful impartation here, and I had to take it back. Here at this meeting? At this meeting and took it back with me and uh, one of the ladies that I prayed for over there she uh, was only given a month to live this was in November I went back last year and they said that uh, you know she only had to Christmas to live she had uh, uh, her hemoglobin level I'm not a, a medical person but it was down to 60 whatever that means but it was very very low she was on dialysis, they'd given up in that area, and she needed full-time care. She couldn't look after herself. Anyway, I prayed for her, and, and normally I'd, I'd just lay hands on her, but this time I just uh, hugged her, and it's like the power of God just, uh, just went, went out of me. And, uh, and then since that time, she... Uh, uh, the healing manifestation. She was at every meeting. This lady's 80 years of old age, and uh, she was at every meeting, and uh, she couldn't stop, you know, uh, chasing after the things of God. <laughs> she was full. Glory yeah. to God. We had people from leukemia. We oh. had. Uh, who was it? Your wife. Yeah, my wife. That had the cut her hand terribly. My and my my five year old. Anna's sister, five-year-old daughter, in the meeting, she was sitting on the front row. She got filled with the Holy Ghost in the meeting without getting hands laid on. The next day, she was speaking in tongues around the house, and uh, my wife cut a finger that day. Really badly. And uh, she prayed for her. Sliced her hand. Just prayed in tongues, and the bleeding stopped straight away. Praise God. So we're uh, we in have, the flow. We're in the flow, and the Australia's in the flow. And um, we, we do want to thank you, dear Father. We thank you for Australia. Everything you're doing there. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
prophesied by Smith Wigglesworth started now. Glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. 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 We thank you for it. Helen Ivisovich. Is that you? I see there. You're in on that. Yes. Praise God. Mark. Lots of us are in on this. Bless the Lord. We praise God. Lord, we lift this up to you. We thank to you that the billion flow goes to Australia. We're thanking you for those elections they had. And Father, we just thank you. We offer every bit of this to you with ourselves. Receive it to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now this is Anna. Lift your hands and praise the Lord. Lift your hands and praise the Lord. Anna has an anointing when she sings. It comes out over us. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing on Anna's life. <laughs> oh, God. Everything you want out of her. 
We pray for it to come forth. The gifts and the callings in on us. Be unwrapped. And may the supernatural flow the power to the miracles and the move that you have for Australia. In Jesus' name, we thank you. You be unwrapped to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, we pray and thank you, Lord. Let's praise God for the gift in honor. We need all the gifts of God. We need every person, every part of the body of Christ functioning. Every marvelous gift that he has for us, we receive and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Brother Dale. About what? What? Yes. How long would it take you? Okay, he wants to share something here. You may be seated. Just uh, want to share about our Prime Minister John Howard and, and the, the election we had in Australia. When was that election? On the 9th of October. Yeah. It was going to be the time when uh, uh, Brother Copeland was going to be on the Gold Coast. And, uh, but we had an incredible victory. And uh, just a few months before, uh, the, uh, I just want to encourage the yes. saints in, in, a, in America. Thank you, yes. And just bef a few months before the election, uh, on the television, uh, I don't know whether you know about Prime Minister John Howard, but he's, he's a real fit man. He's in his, in his 60s, and he's really fit. And uh, every morning, he goes for a, a marathon. And if you see him on the, the, the TV at all, the news reporters will, will catch him in the morning going for a run. And um, this particular morning, um, outside his house, he'll go for a run every morning from his house in, in Sydney. This particular morning, there was protesters there, protesting against him. It was the, the Greens, what you might call the tree huggers. And uh, they were protesting against him on some environmental issues. Anyway, uh, Prime Minister John Howard started on his run anyway. He wasn't... Uh, he wasn't uh, floored by what they were on about. And it was just inc so hilarious. He kept on running and, and we had those protesters chasing after him, but they couldn't catch him. <laughs> they couldn't catch him. And my wife, she just at that particular time, she got in the spirit that Prime Minister John Howard is a forerunner, a forerunner for the nation of Australia, but also a forerunner for this world. Yes, Ooh. yes. And when I arrived here in America, I thought I was just coming over here to receive and take back what I received last year in impartation, but the Lord just spoke through and said, you're taking over the same spirit that won the victory in Australia. I'm bringing it over here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the victory. And I saw in the spirit John Howard having a baton like a runner in, a, in the Olympics. And I saw him passing on that to George Bush. Take this baton, George Bush, and run with it. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh. Thank you, Brother Dale. We receive your your blessings and the anointing of Anna. Thank you, Lord. Thank you very much. Please be seated. That's that ship. Remember those two ships? Well, uh, this morning, 
uh, Gloria, you, you can just stay down there, but you're going to help me remember with, uh, to remember. <laughs> um, I want you to uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Excuse me, 2 Timothy 3. And the Lord recently had given me a sermon on who was on the Lord's side. It came from heaven, and it's out there. You could get it. I'm not going to preach it, but he told me to tell to the young people that these things are all up, that his side is the Bible. It's time to say which side you're on, and that these things are opposite his side. So we must get opposite them. And here's what they are. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, and on and on. And then it ends with, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now, Chip said, I don't, did you get that from Rick Renner's book, honey, or did you get it from um, uh, Strong's? About the word denying that it actually means you resist. You won't receive. You resist it, the power of God. You resist the supernatural. And um, there is going to be now a great manifestation of the supernatural power of God, and we have to be ready for it. Now, at uh, Down at Eagle Mountain Church, the Lord sent Brother Justice Duplessy, who was the brother of Dr. David Duplessy, who's called Mr. Pentecost. And uh, George Pearson interviewed him, and he asked him, because they had such supernatural things happening in South Africa, and they had such supernatural things happening in those early times of Pentecost. Now, uh, Brother Justice has gone on to be with the Lord, but they did get this on video. Now, he said, one thing was, people preached all the time that Jesus is coming soon. But then he talked about something they had, which we don't have, is translations. And that translations were, they had them often. Someone would be translated. You know, like Philip was translated in the Bible. He was, he was in one place and then he was translated. Now, when I came in, in 1967, under Brother Hagen. The charismatic world was saying some th such things. They had a magazine like we're going down in a hole and we're going to have to have the survival food and we're going to have to have a kerosene stove and somebody named they is going to come and get our Bibles. And <sighs> But I came in to Brother Hagen's meetings where there was Sister Grace, Sister Wilkerson, Mama and Papa Goodwin, others, and they were prophesying a glorious church filled with the glory of God. And they prophesied such things as we'd be walking down the street and our faces would be shining with the glory. And they prophesied translations that there would be a man in, now this is one of Brother Hagin's prophecies, there would be a man in California, it would be live TV, everybody would know that man and they would know he was on live TV and then suddenly he's going to be picked up by live TV cameras in New York. Brother Duplessy told stories about, he told about them being high up in the mountains in a foggy night having to come down. And they'd been having a meeting up there. And I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. They'd been having a meeting up there. And um, it was impossible to drive down that mountain that night. And them, all the preachers and the, the team and their car was translated home into the garage. Huh? That's right. The whole carload of them. And another one was, um, what about the bus? I forgot the one about the bus. The bus was, uh, there was a man that worked late. And there you go. It's on. Is it on? Okay. There was a man working late in the city. And the last bus was, seems to me, like at 11 o'clock. And he lived far away and he had to get home. And so he got to the bus stop, and he had missed the bus. 
and he prayed and believed God, and I don't know exactly the details that happened after that, but he did. He uh, he was instantly at home, in another place. Those are the, there were about three of them. There was yeah, there another, was another time yeah. when the uh, when there was uh, a, a father. The, the Lord said that this father, if he didn't get there soon, this father was was gonna, but, was going to kill his son. Yeah. He was he was tearing into him so. And they were a good long way, and they were walking. They were, you know, they apparently didn't have a car to get there, and so it took. So they prayed and believed God, and they were instantly there. It was like if you needed it, it was there, you know. Yes. I mean, I'm sure it didn't happen 25 times a day, but it happened. And yes. those are the three things that I remember him telling yes. about. So we need to expand ourselves past the little eggshell that we might be in. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to crack out of this eggshell around you and you have to believe and then we'll not deny these things when they happen. So we have today for you a witness of translation. And so I'm inviting Marilyn Wheeler, if you'll come please. Billy, while they're, while they're coming, uh, I've been praying for some time about that in this way, for the Lord to break the distance barrier. Okay, there's a so distance that, barrier. So that we can be here one moment and there the next. Marilyn is a dear, dear friend of the Copeland. She's a good friend of mine. I've known her for many years. I wish I had known her husband, Al. And so she's going to give you, you tell them about Al, what a great man he was. And is, yes. hallelujah, there are no dead saints, you know. Both of our husbands have moved to heaven. And uh, Marilyn is going to tell you, I don't want you to leave out the part about, what, about him, his oil and how he could okay. hit the whole, don't, don't leave out anything. You have the time I told you that I gave you in the beginning. Okay, thank you. I shared this testimony here with you about three years ago with this same crowd, so some of you are going to remember some of it. But we have something a little extra special for you today with the testimony. Yes, my, my husband was a great, is a great saint of the Lord. He just moved to a new home. He was um, kind of a pioneer in some of the supernatural things that went on around him. You know, Ken Copeland told me right after my husband's death, he was tragically killed in a car accident. Actually, a Frito Lay truck ran over him. I didn't eat potato chips for a long time, but then I realized... <laughs> Then I realized that they were probably going to support me the rest of my life, so maybe I should keep them in business. Um, my husband was a petroleum engineer in the oil business, and we lived in Oklahoma. And he drilled lots and lots of wells. I think something around uh, 4,000 oil wells, and he only had one dry hole. And he didn't want to drill that well. He was doing it for some more people. And uh, every well that he drilled, he always prayed over it. I can remember one time when he had the uh, pipe stuck in the hole. If any of you are in the oil business, that's just about the worst thing that can happen to you when you're drilling a well is to stick that pipe in the hole because it, that's going to cost you a million dollars or more just to pull the pipe up to get it loosened. But he'd go out there and pray over it. He'd just say, I command you in the name of Jesus to come up out of that hole. And I, I'm sure that some of the men working for him, that were different crews were in there, probably thought, this is a crazy man. But it worked. And that pipe would be loosened. It'd just come shooting up through the hole. And he had lots and lots of experiences like that. And the Lord really uh, blessed him in his business. And he was, he was a very successful businessman. And he was very generous to the... Um, to all the ministries. He made sure that all the ministers in, in our town where we lived had a new car every year and, and just blessed the people. That He lived to bless the people. I remember one time our banker told him, he said, Al, you don't quit giving all your money away. You're not going to have anything. And Al said, you know, that's the only thing I am going to have. That's what I give away. And that's, that's still true. That's still true. So, he, he, so they say you can't take it with you. Well, guess what? He did. It's, it's, it was there when he got there. And I know uh, right after he died, Kenneth Copeland was telling me, he said, you know, sometimes we got to remember this, that we are in a war. 
And in this war, sometimes our people on the front lines, they get killed. They just do. And he was one of them that did. Uh, he, was, uh, he was 50 years old when he, when he was killed. Uh, young in his life, just really in the prime of his life, doing a lot of great things for the Lord. But he went on to be with the Lord, and he left behind a testimony that I'm going to share with you today. I, told, I tell people all the time, it's not my testimony, but I inherited it. So I get to share it. In 1960, well, let me, let me share something with you before I get into that. Uh, all of you know, I'm sure, C. P Peter Wagner, very well known in our circles and a great writer, did the book. Uh, how to have a healing ministry in any church. And he wrote lots of instances in there about miracles that were happening in the world. You know, we're living in the time of, Billy talks about it all the time, and I've really picked up on a lot of it through the years from her. We're living in a time of the glory of the Lord. And in that glory, there is the supernatural. And I was thinking just a little bit ago, we've talked a lot about all the bad things that are going on in the world, and there's lots of it. Just turn on your TV or your computer or whatever, and it's, you're going to see it. But we must always remember that scripture where sin doth abound, the grace of God doth more abound. So with what's happening in the world, with all of the evil that's going on, the, the church is getting stronger. We're not getting weaker. The Lord's not coming back after a snaggletooth, a draggled old hag. He's coming back for a bride without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish or any such thing. So we've got to be strong. We've got to gird ourselves with the full armor of God and stand in this war that we're in and fight because we're not going to lose. We haven't lost. We're not. Jesus won it for us at Calvary. It's already won. We just have to remember that and keep going and saying, you know, we've already won the war. So let's don't lose these battles. So we must remember that all the things that are going on in the world, even in the technology, even in all the things that they're doing, it can all be done in the supernatural also. I believe that when we become born again, we even get a new DNA. I believe we do. And with that DNA, our bodies are not tied to this earth. Our bodies can move in and out. Some of these experiences that uh, Sister Billy was sharing with you and, and Gloria, that's, that's not only possible, it's happening. And we may not be hearing about it as much as we're going to be hearing about it because we're moving into a new time. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. This is a time when I believe that when, when people are prayed for that are minus an arm, I believe that arm's going to grow back. Right. It, it, it's coming. We're coming into that day and that age. It's going to happen. So we've had some pioneers that have gone on ahead of us that have experienced some of these things. You know, in a Reinhardt Bonnke meeting, not too awfully long ago, they brought a man in that was in his casket that was dead. And uh, the Lord brought him back to life. He was raised back to life. And those, those things are happening. So we're moving into that era now. At the time is now. That, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that we are moving into that time. Now, why I brought this up about the book, I'm going to read the first paragraph because it tells just a little bit about my husband's experience of what, what happened. And he named this spiritual transportation. He said, Luke tells the story of an angry crowd in Nazareth that had decided to kill Jesus by pushing him over a cliff. But he escaped by passing through the midst of them. We're not told how he got through, but it could have been that God bypassed the usual restrictions of time and space and supernaturally transported his body to another space. This is not beyond possibility because it apparently is exactly what did happen to Philip after he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. The spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he said, admittedly, my research is not uncovered many contemporary examples of spiritual transpiration, but I do have a rather remarkable antidote about Oklahoma oil magnate Al Wheeler. And so then he goes on to tell the story somewhat in that book. And we have left copies of these. One of your people had them earlier, and I think they're going to be on um, your table back there. In 1968, my husband and I were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, what he would do is, what, when they were drilling wells, he would go out on the well and he'd engineer it from start to finish. So he had gone to a little small town in Kansas, Coldwater, Kansas, actually. And while he was there, 
They were drilling the well. It was on a Wednesday night, and he went into town. He was staying in a little motel in cold water. And across the street from the motel was a little church. And as was Al's habit of never missing a church service if he didn't have to, he went over to the church. Now, Al was a man that people said, even at his funeral, that he could talk the strings off of a banjo. So he, was, <laughs> he, he had a gift of speaking. And he got up and gave his testimony. It was just a church he'd never been in his life. But back in those days, people will stand up, I love the Lord and I thank God for this and that. And they just give a little small testimony. He just stood up and said, you know, I'm very thankful to be here tonight that the Lord's preserved me and kept me and blah, blah, blah. So then he left the service and went back to the motel room where he, where he was staying. So it was about 10 o'clock at night. And he watched the news and at 10.30 came on his favorite show, Gunsmoke. So he had to watch Gunsmoke. And um, this was in 1968. He was a, a very young man at the time. And um, he said he was watching Gunsmoke and then all at once he said he was in a place that was so dark. He said it was a dark, dark place. And he said, I'm walking amongst the trees. And he said, there's just lots of, lots of brush and lots of uh, foliage there. And he said, I'm walking uh, among that. And he said, I'm looking around. I'm thinking, where in the world am I? And he said, he saw further ahead, he saw a light. So he said, he walked toward that light. And when he got, it just opened into an opening and said, he went into that opening. There was lots of trees there, lots of little huts with grass on them, grass thatched huts, and lots of black, black people. He said, I don't think I've ever seen people that black before. And so he said he walked up to a, a porch there where there was an old man there leaning on the porch and said he had a big old long stick with him, just a gnarled stick, and said he was kind of holding on to that stick. And a young man standing next to him said the young man looked like he was maybe 14 or 15 years old. So Al said, I walked up to that porch, and he said, for some reason, I just started sharing that testimony that I had given the night before at church. He said, it just came out of me. I just started talking to him about Jesus. And the old man said, our God is greater than your God. And Al said, there's no God greater than my God. And he said, our God is greater than your God. And he began to tell him what they could do. He said, we could make, I never will forget Al telling this. He said, we can make chickens talk. We can take dolls and we can stick pins in them and we can cause uh, lots of pain. We could even cause death to people. And now, so that's not the kind of God I serve. I serve a God that will bring people back to life. I serve a God that will, that will take you to heaven someday. When, you, when you've left this earth, you can go live with him. And I'll just begin sharing these things. Well, the man was not receiving it at all. He was getting very angry. Lots of people had gathered by then. So the old man threw that stick down right in front of Al and Al said it just turned into a poisonous snake and just started hissing at him. This is a very important part to remember this part here. And so he said the snake was just, and he said, in the name of Jesus, be still. And he said, it just went right back into a stick. Sound like a familiar story, doesn't it? <laughs> so <clears throat> Al said, then the townspeople, following the example of this old man, began to pick up uh, rocks and throw at him. And... Uh, Al said it was, he thought it was time to leave. So he said he turned around and started back through the forest. When he's going through the forest, it was damp and a little bit mushy and so on and so forth as he was running through it. But he said, I was running as fast as I could. He said, I could hear them behind me chasing after me. He said, so I turned around to look, and I just saw the kid that was standing on the porch with the old man, the man that was 14 or 15 years old. So Al said, I stopped. And he said, he came running up to me, and he said, I want to know more about what you were talking about. And he said, the other first thing he said, which I thought was so funny, he said, and what are you driving? And uh, he said, we didn't hear a car come into, up to the village, and we didn't hear, you know, anything. So how did you get here? And Al said, yeah, I don't know how I got here, but I can tell you about Jesus. And he began to explain to him about Jesus and what Jesus had done for him. And this young man was really taking it all in. And Al said he was going through the plan of salvation with this young man. And all at once he said he saw a light in front of him. He said he stepped into it. Next thing he knew, he said he woke up. And he was in, he was in his room there in the motel. And he looked at the clock. It was 7 o'clock in the morning. And he thought, that is the strangest dream I've ever had. I've never had a dream like that before. It must, must be prophetic. It must mean something. So he said he 
noticed he had slept in his clothes and he even had his boots on. He had not, he had not undressed or anything. He just went to sleep while he was watching Gunsmoke. So he said he, he slid his feet off the side of the bed to get up and he looked down and he had mud on his boots. <laughs> I'd just been to church the night before. He sure wouldn't have gone in dirty boots. So he said, that, he said, man, what did I do? Did I get up and walk around, you know, in a dream or whatever? The door was still locked. They were in a drought in Kansas. So he didn't know where he could have gotten that mud. He was puzzled. So he just tucked the boots off, put another pair on, and threw those in the back of his car. Went out to the well, and when he got to the well, he had Halliburton at the well. And they, all, they have a soils lab that they carry with them. And every time you go down in the well a certain depth, you pull up a sample. And they were pulling samples that day. They were pulling the samples up, and they bring them, they put them under all their microscopes, and they analyze that soil, and they see if they're close to the oil or if they're in the oil, wherever they are. They do that periodically. So Al took his boots in there, and he said, Guys, I want you to analyze this, this mud that's on my boots and tell me where it came from. They said, Yeah, just toss it over there. When we get to it, we'll do it. So he went on up on the rigs. So about an hour later, one of the guys came up there and said, Al, where have you been? And uh, he said, why many where? Just here. And they said, well, this, this mud that's on your boots, we did analyze it. And Al said, yeah, where'd it come from? They said, well, there's only one place in the world that has this particular kind of mud, and it comes from someplace in East Africa. <laughs> Al said, well, I have, I've been all over the world, but I've never been to East Africa. And they said, well, that's, that's where this mud comes from. Where'd you get these? And Al said, oh, it's a long story. <laughs> so he came home to Tulsa, and he's told me the story. My first question was, you know, had you had Mexican food the night before? You know, I, w I was always the real believing one in the family. So he said, well, what do you think I should do? And he said, I think I'll, I'll tell one of our neighbors that was a football coach in Tulsa that had just become born again. So Al told, his name was Joe Reeder, and Al told Joe, said, listen, I had this story, and he said, oh, Joe, Al, if I were you, I don't, probably wouldn't tell that anymore. <laughs> so uh, we were attending a church there. Leroy Baker was our pastor. Leroy Baker became the president of Southwestern Bible College in Oklahoma City right after that. So Al went to our pastor and told him, he said, yeah, Al, that's just pretty strange. We're talking about just the beginning of the charismatic movement. Things had not gotten real strange, you know. <laughs> so he said, that's just, that's a little strange, Al. You know, you're very analytical and, and you know, you're not the type of man that has these kind of really weird experiences. Leave that for somebody else, you know, one of the hippies or somebody to have that kind of experience. I don't think you should tell it anymore. So Al said, okay. That was in 1968. In 19... In the late 70s, uh, Al was asked to be on the advisory board of Melody Land uh, School in California, their school of theology. Ralph, Walker, Ralph Walkerson headed that up. And uh, so they asked Al to be on their board out there, and he agreed to, I, I, I think, because he was supporting the school. He really always believed in He loved preachers. Favorite people in the world was preachers. Boy, he loved them. I think he always really wanted to be one. That was his thing. In fact, one time he thought that he would be a preacher, and he went out and bought himself a guitar and bought me a piano. So. <laughs> because he thought that's, that's what it would take. He would learn how to play that fancy guitar, and I'd learn how to play the piano. We could go in the ministry. <laughs> so, um, and, and he did speak at, at churches. When the pastor would go on vacation, they would leave it up to him to speak, and... Uh, Sometimes he got invited back, sometimes he didn't. <laughs> i never forget when he spoke in the Christian church, first Christian church. Our pastor just loved out because he had just bought him a new car, as he had lots of the other pastors. So he said, you know, I'm going to be gone on vacation next week, Al. Would you fill in for me? And Al agreed to do it. And I told Al, I said, now, Al, don't get up there and talk too long. If you do, I'm going to go like this. <laughs> and you stop. Because, you know, these people are used to 20 minutes, and they want out of here because they've got to be the first ones to the, to the cafes around the restaurants, you know. <laughs> so Al gets up there, and he gets to talking, and the first thing you know, he's denouncing the Elks Club, where everybody was going to drink and dance every night. <laughs> and everybody in there was a member. <laughs> so I'm sitting back there, and I'm going... 
And you know what he did? I never did this again after this happened that night. He said, you know, I think my wife has a sore throat. <laughs> and I'm just going to have her come up here and we're going to pray for her. He, he should not have gone home that day. They, because they don't pray for the sick in the Christian, first Christian church either. But, but he had a healing line anyway. I was the first one through it. And then one time he was invited to go out to uh, the First Nazarene Church in Fruitland, New Mexico. And that is out on the reservation. I mean, it is full of chiefs and princesses out there. I mean, it's all, practically all Indian, but most of them could speak English. And so they asked him, say, oh, would you come preach at my church such and such Sunday? And I said, yeah, I will. And they said, now don't forget to take up the offering because we've got to teach the people how to give. I said, I said, oh, I don't need any offering. Don't need any offering. So no, that's not it. We've got to teach the people how to give, so be sure and take up the offering. So the first mistake he made when we got there was asking if anybody played the piano so we could have a song service, you know. No. Well, my wife will play the piano then, he said. <laughs> now, I don't even know A, B, C on the piano. <laughs> I owned a piano because we were going in the ministry. <laughs> but, but I didn't know how to play one note on it. So he said, honey, come on up here, come on up here. <clears throat> now you talk about living by faith. You have to live by faith when you're in a situation like that. So what could I do? You know, I got up and I went up there and I sat at the piano and they're going to sing this song, No, Not One. You remember that old song, No, Not One? So I'm sitting there on that piano, No, Not One, No, Not One. <laughs> But, but Al just, Al believed that God could meet the need, see? At any moment, God could meet the need. It didn't matter what it was. He just had the faith that would happen. So I pounded that piano for all it was worth. So then he gets up and he delivers the word and, he's, and my little son, Steve, was about maybe three years old at the time. And so he runs up there next to his dad and he's pulling on his dad's leg. Now he's going, you know, <laughs> preaching the word and Steve's pulling, dad, dad, dad. Now he's going, you know. <laughs> Finally, he looks down at him, he said, what is it, son? He said, you forgot the offering. <laughs> so he stops and takes the offering, finishes his, his sermon, and we get ready to leave. All those people came up to me and they said, that was the most beautiful music. <laughs> now, now that, was, that was a translation experience. The Lord, <laughs> for sure. The Lord translated that noise I was hitting on that piano into music. He did. They said that was beautiful. Every song was perfectly played. It was beautiful. I was wanting to be translated about that. I would like to have had that translation experience myself at that time. I was sitting on that piano bench. I thought, when I get out of here, he's dead. I mean, you know, he's just, just dead. So, but, but that, was, that was Al's personality. That's the way he was. He just believed God. I mean, if Jonah had swallowed the whale, he would have, somebody told him that, he would have believed that. Yeah, he just believed God. Like, and they said at his funeral, Al believed God like a child. He just believed God like a child. He really did. So the Lord was able to use him in some of these 
experiences because of his faith and trust in the Lord. He just believed it. He didn't have doubt. So 10 years have gone by since this, he'd had this experience. And we went, we were called and asked to come to Melody Land. They wanted to do a taping on an oil man comes to El Melody Land. So they asked us to come out and be on television. So uh, Al went out there. And one of the uh, associate pastors with Ralph Wilkerson was a pastor by the name of uh, Cecil Pumphrey. Now Cecil pastors over in Tupelo, Mississippi now. I don't, I don't know what church I've spoken there. I don't remember what church it was. But he had heard Al's testimony before. And he just had thought a lot about it. And it really was in his heart because he, he figures into this in just a little bit. So anyway, Al just went and they just asked him about the drilling of the wells and how successful he had been and all these sort of things. So he gave his testimony. We got through and we left and we were in the Melody Land. It's just across the street from, from Disneyland. And it was like one of the very first churches in the big charismatic movement that came along in the 60s. And uh, Ralph Wilkerson would have speakers in from all over the world and really, really was a beautiful church that really ex had a lot of people that came into it that spoke on their experiences. And it was one of the very first big charismatic churches. So Al and I were walking down the hall after we had finished our, uh, giving our testimony on TV that night about the oil business. And as we walked down the hall, coming toward us, were several people, but there was a man in a long white, um, I forget what they call them, something they wear, they wear normally when they're from Africa or somewhere like this, you'll see them in these long things, a turban on their head and all this, you know. As we walked past him, Al looked at this man and he stopped and he said, do I know you? And this black man just stopped and looked at him and Al said, I think I know you. I have seen you somewhere. I have met you somewhere. And this black man said, well, hmm, I'm from Uganda. And uh, he said, I'm from uh, East Africa, Uganda, East Africa. Al said, no, I've never been there. And he said, Al said, it seems like I've seen you somewhere then. And the black man said, oh, you came to my village when I was a young man. Al said, no, I've never been to Uganda. He said, yeah, you came. To my village. He said, do you remember my uncle that was the witch doctor was standing on a porch with me and you were talking about Jesus and he threw his staff down, his stick down and it turned into a snake? Al said, yes, I remember that. <laughs> so he said, well, how come you say you've never been to Africa? And Al said, well, I've never been to Africa, but I remember that experience. And they shared some about the experience. And the young man said, you remember I ran after you in the woods? And Al said, yes. He said, I wanted to know what you were driving. And Al said, well, I wasn't driving anything. And he said, well, you told me all about Jesus. It's become a huge influence in my life. And now I'm here in, in America. And Al said, you know what? We need to talk. The young man's name was Joel. His name was Joel Wallowa. And Al said, let's go across the street to the uh, hotel over there and we need to talk. Now let me tell you something this morning. That man's here. A man that loves the Lord, carries the word of God around. Joel, let's talk to the people about how we met that day, what you felt the day you met Al or when you went to go back to the village the day that he showed up. How old were you? Sixteen. Okay. When we met you <coughs> in Melody Land coming down the hallway and Al stopped and said, I know you. And after you talked a little while, recognition came to both of you. And you began to talk to him about your uncle throwing, it was your uncle instead of your father. Okay, tell us a little bit about that, Joel. Some things that's going on with you today. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi. hi. I think in America you say hi. 
I couldn't afford passing there without touching that man because my savior was Jewish. <laughs> Dr. Billy Brim? Yes. For three years. Oh, you're back at me. For three years. Well, I'll try to talk. I don't know the things. We just shout. For three years, I drove between Oklahoma City and Kansas City, Missouri, from Tulsa to Kansas City, Missouri. Yes. Going to St. Paul School of Theology. Yes. Hoping to become a Methodist minister. Yes. All the way to the year 2000. 2000. And I listened. Every time I passed here, I had to turn on that radio ah. to listen to your program. Really? <clears throat> And I longed and said, God, I wish you make me, allow me to meet this woman. Aww. Three years. I drove three days a week, 300 miles one way to go to cemetery, seminary. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for listening, listening to the Holy Spirit. Bless the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, for connection. You have your reward already, and Amen. it's increasing. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Glory. I met Mrs. Copeland. Amen. Gloria. <laughs> Love you, lady. God bless you. I had her. Brother Copeland talking about my, that experience of Al Will and um, I was saying, wow, a time will come and I, I'll meet these people and I hope I'll meet your husband when he comes. He'll be here tonight. It's wonderful to be here. No wonder you are anointed so much. You know what? You look all the way from this way to this end and you're seeing the body of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. From everything. You are so beautiful. You are so wonderful. You are so precious. Heaven is here. Yes. Yes. The Lord of grace is abundant here. Yes, he is. His power yes. is here. My Jesus. And that is not a light thing. I get excited to talk about my Lord, my Savior, and my dad. Woo! I long for it. I, I'm, it's wonderful. Yes. And I, I just want to share my testimony. I, but I, it's just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful it that wonderful. Jesus Christ is Lord with yes. the glory of God. I can't forget when I sat in those little shrines there in Uganda, East Africa, listening to those demons talking. <laughs> and I could shiver and shake and fear. And Uncle calls the rooster and begins talking to teach me how to appease the spirits. Mm. You know, appeasing spirits means, by the way, you Americans, it means you calling your ancestral spirits, and your demons. And now I know they are demons, okay? Yeah, yeah. And you begin talking to them as a chief of the tribal clan. Now I'm the 15th of my mother. My mother had 17 of us. She was like Mrs. Wesley. Yeah. <laughs> and she had had it was nothing but girls, 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 girls. And in those days, even sometimes up to now, women, you know. We didn't, African men never cared much about women. Mm -hmm. So mom has, was always praying, God, give me a son so my husband does not marry another woman. Now here is a tribal chief, the one who appeases his spirits and all that stuff. And here is a woman who is praying. Now, how did it happen? It happened that when the white man began coming in Uganda more and more and more, 
And they began coming to the villages by the 60s. If they are so powerful, since they were so powerful, the chiefs wanted to know who their gods were. Yes, that's why. The first thing you need to know is who is the god. That's why missionaries who first converted the chiefs got the whole tribes converted. So they, mama told papa, let us send our children to the church so they can go to school to learn the white man's language so we can know their God. It made logic, but mom didn't want witchcraft. She had heard so much about Christianity, Anglican church. So she, dad accepted, agreed, and um, being the child who was being groomed to become the next chief tribal leader, clan leader, and therefore the man to appease the evil spirits and so on, they begin you right from the day you are born to teach you these things. So my theological school was first a school in witchcraft and I did all that stuff and you graduate by appeasing the spirits in the sense that you make roosters talk or something like that. And I had graduated. And so, because mother prayed, mother began telling us, sons, if you want to pass your exams, read the Bible. But the reason she really took us to school was so that we can read the Bible for her. Hmm. We didn't read the Bible for her. Those young people in those days are just like young people today. We are disobedient. We just do what we want. And mother prayed every morning. She woke up us by prayer. Because Dad did not know that. He had already gone to his witchcraft things. So mom prayed to God of heaven. And when daddy comes back, she stops praying. <laughs> Women are wise. <laughs> you men. It's true. And in the end, mother began, called me one morning. I said, son, come here. I came and said, open the Bible in the vernacular. And she began reading. I didn't understand it all. Mom, how come? She said, I prayed and God told me, I'll teach you how to read the Bible. And he's teaching me how to read the Bible. So if you want to pass your exams, read the Bible. I began reading the Bible and so on. It never made a sense. But then what was very interesting is that the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego seemed to be in the Bible. It seemed to agree with the once a year we come together to appease the spirits, that is to call the ancestral spirits and promise them how many chickens and goats and ch people we shall sacrifice for that year so that they don't kill our people, so the spirits, pro the spirits protect us, so the spirits give us a lot of rain and our crops grow. Grow praying to the evil spirits, sacrificing chicken and goats and cows and sometimes twice I've seen sacrifice of humans in my uncle's shrines. I could see miracles happening. Miracles, yes. People being healed. But what happened really was this. Now listen to me. This, very, very, this is a connection. This connection is very important for me now than ever before. This testimony is beginning to make sense today more than ever before. Sure. The connection is very simple. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blessings over Israel. Yes. That ushers in all nations when they have loved Israel and contributed especially America and then all nations turning to hate Israel. That's right. Then the Lord comes quickly. Yes. That's what is very important. It's very important because 1948... The United Nations, yeah, the United Nations, tried to con, to break the contract between Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of, of Israel. Is that Ben-Gurion? Yes. And they offered him Uganda in order, as an alternative for settlement. Those of you who know history know that. That's right. 
And that stubborn Jewish boy said, no. We, so you told us you would give us back our land. Yes. And Israel was born around Tel Aviv. Yes. From that time, Israel never left out Uganda. Israel came and built and re- co- constructed Uganda. Most of the things that you see in Uganda were done by Israel because Israel never forsook the land that they were being given at that time. There's a connection. Yes, there is. Did you hear Ronnie Levy last night? He lived in Uganda. Yes, as a little boy from six onwards. Yes. Israel built Uganda until 1972 when Idi Amin expelled them from Uganda and the Asians. When the Entebbe raid took place, when the Jews were hijacked to Entebbe, I was there. That's the reason why I'm in America today. I had gone to Canada to preach the gospel. Maureen Gagladi yeah. had invited me to give the testimony on Uganda because it's Maureen in 1960. Maureen that gave the money to Brother. Yes. Wow. She's the one who saw a map of Africa with a land called Uganda burning with a fire. Oh my goodness. And she cried and said, Uganda, 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 in, in Glad Tidings Temple, Canada, Vancouver, BC. The same one that gave the million dollars to Ronnie's father. Maureen Gagladi said, called here, her brother said, what's Uganda? Where's Uganda? What's Uganda? What's Uganda? Tell me Uganda. Go on the map, find Uganda. Said, oh, it's a land in Africa. We are sending missionaries there right away. Because Uganda is going to burn and God has chosen that nation. The first full gospel came from Maureen Gagladi, Canada. There's a connection where I'm here. Oh, dear God. Oh, Lord. We don't want to miss any of these connections, Lord. I'm not a stranger. I'm your family. I love Israel. I pr- My wife wakes up at 5 in the morning. I, didn't, I never knew why she disappeared all the time. I'll introduce her in a minute. But she disappeared for an hour. I didn't know why she was. She was praying for me. She prays for me always. That's why I'm strong. I got a good woman behind me. Oh my, Jesus, help us not to miss. Maureen got a panel, and by that time, because Canada is a British, British Commonwealth, they, they could come to Uganda freely because Uganda was British Commonwealth country. Some Americans wanted to join. Uganda government said no because the racial program, problem is in America. America could not go anywhere in Africa in the 60s, beginning of 60s. So people like uh, Bud Sikla and so on had to go to Canada to get Canadian passports to come to Uganda. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the Spirit of God moved in Uganda beginning of 1960 to the time of independence that cripples were brought from everywhere in the country and they could stand up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. God operated in Uganda in the physical. Yes. It had been under Idi Amin, remember that? Not yet. It was not, not yet under yet, Idi Amin. Yet. Oh, yeah. But God had begun at that time to set up a stage for Before he, that? Yes. God began moving because of Maureen Gagladi. God bless her heart. Because of Maureen. You remember Maureen, the little lady in the picture? Yeah. Very short little lady. When I met her in Canada, and she said, Brother Joe, go back and preach the gospel. That woman was just like you. That's what Ronnie says. Yes. That's what Ronnie says. Oh, yes. Uh oh. <laughs> Sister Gliari, we heard that French airline flight 300, three, flight something had been kidnapped, hijacked to Entebbe. <clears throat> now, at this time, I was Idi Amin's, I had taught his kids, I was a, a full time preacher, I had quit um, the, 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 the ministry because of the persecution of the church. 
and I had to leave immediately to go to Uganda because I knew Idi Amin was go, what he was going to do to, do, to do to the Jews. My pastors and churches came to meet me at the airport. Large crowd came when, whenever I came from overseas, they could come to meet me to, to talk, to, to hear the good news from another land. We know that as a glass of cold water to a thirsty spirit, so, so is good news from a distant country. So when somebody's coming in from overseas, we want to hear the good news, especially from the Lord Jesus. And I, the French airline was there, and the, the, the Jews, 136 who were in the building, small building, guarded by these uncircumcised at heart Arabs. And as soon as I stepped off, down from the plane, the church was already worshiping and praising God there. During the Idi Amin time, we are under persecution, but the church never ceased to praise God. Praise God. They could come and face us with a gun and say, deny Jesus Christ, and we say, go ahead and shoot. Because you're helping, right. me, helping me to go to heaven. Just shoot me. That's right. I bear wounds in my body, beaten for the gospel. I told the soldiers, you soldiers, Israel is God's, is God's apple, the apple of God's eye. Yes. If you let these uncircumcised Arabs to hurt them, Uganda will go down the drain. A captain came and began beating me and stopping me and kicking me, pulled out his gun. And I said, I said, wait a minute, before you shoot me. I was bleeding at that time. Before you shoot me. And the church, you know, it's so funny. You, you, you charismatics are very funny people. <laughs> they are busy beating me up and people are saying, praise God, hallelujah, Jesus. I mean, you can see people burning the devil. Something, some people are worshiping and so on. And I said, wait a minute, don't shoot me. I want to tell you something. Thank you for helping me to go to Jesus. My angels are waiting to pick my body and take me home. But as soon as I stay, get in front of Jesus, I'll tell him to save your soul so you can preach in my place. Like Paul. Stephen. What? What? What do you say? What do you say? said, shoot, go ahead, shoot. You're wasting one bullet. That's government money. You're wasting it. I'm already, I'm already dead. I'm a dead body. The Bible says I'm dead in Christ. You shoot me and I'll tell Jesus to save you. And then tomorrow you'll be a preacher. You're a fool, you're a fool. And he ran off. <laughs> At that time, the saints picked me up, took me to my house, began praying. And that's when I began feeling the pain because when they beat you, you don't feel it. Oh, I believe that. You Jesus. just don't. Now you listen very carefully because they will begin whipping you soon in America. Islam. Liberalism. Islam. Liberalism. And most of the Democratic Party platform ideology is going to make it impossible for Christians in America to enjoy the freedom you are enjoying today. It will happen. Oh God, that's not a doom. We're not giving it up. That's not a doom. That is the greatest God would have, thing God would have allowed you guys to show the power in you. When you can stand and say, go on, devil, make my day. <laughs> when you can see the dead and say, in the name of Jesus, bring them here. Look what me. Jesus said, I'm, alive, I'm the life. Yeah. Jesus said, the works I do, shall you do also. That's what he said. He raised the dead. That's what he said. And you say, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. Three times I've seen the dead raised in the name of Jesus. Praise God. They brought in, we, we had had Brother Morris Cerullo in Africa preaching the gospel. And, and he had gone and he picked his flyers, these big things you Americans do to advertise. Morris Cerullo, what evangelistic, whatever, with a big picture of Morris Cerullo there. <laughs> what we did was we cut out the picture of Morris Cerullo. 
and he brought a big white paper there and got nice black ink and said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Bring the sick, bring the lame, bring the cripple, bring the dead you have not buried, and we shall raise them up. You know, and we trick them around because Americans have come, they brought thousands of flyers, they are there useless. So now, why not cut out that and put something in you? The people come because of the flyer. They throw that's an American flyer, so an American mi- preacher is there. Then they find these African man ministers preach the gospel. And one day, one of these meetings, they bring in a box, as, you know, with a dead draw girl in it. From a mortuary, three days in the mortuary, they were taking the body home to bury. And they said, What? They said, Bring even the dead you have not buried. So they come and say, we are, we, are, we are ending the meeting. We are just closing the meeting. Says, well, we have brought our daughter is dead and so on. So we wanted to say, as a preacher, I said, well, well we, the meetings are over. We'll pray, we'll pray for you. <laughs> you know, sometimes preachers, you know, I can identify myself. You know, we have a lot of things in the common, you people here, you know. You remember the guy who was here last night? The shovel man with the... Is he here? He'll be back. He had to go home and preach, and then he'll be back. This evening? Uh, no, he won't be here this evening. He'll be back Sunday night. Tomorrow? Yeah. I, I, I want to tell him we have a lot in common. I've had a lot of those experiences, but not from us, us as from, uh, from animals. A lot of people have lost, have lost their rear from hyenas <laughs> out there in the bush. <laughs> so we have a lot in common. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm looking forward for Sister Marilyn to go. I took my wife to Africa, not told, told, told us nothing. And then when she wanted to go there, I, asked, I told her, there is a big snake out there. <laughs> that, that was the most unkind thing I really apologized to her. That was very unkind. Yes. But when you tell an African to do something, they do it. So tell them, bring the dead, they'll bring the dead. <laughs> Because they know the preacher is not talking on his own. They look at a preacher like a witch doctor, a man speaking on behalf of the spirits. Ah. So whatever the man is telling them, the spirits, if we don't do it, the spirits will destroy us. Therefore, we must, they look at a preacher as somebody representing higher power. That's so when you true. say, that says the Lord, they are not listening to you. They know God is talking. They better do it. That's why you see lots of miracles happening because we believe. We don't say, is that really true? <laughs> so the brother said, any of you who have doubts, move back. They're telling other ministers. And we are obedient. Those who are doubtless, doubt, doubtful, they moved back. And those with the faith come forward and we hardly prayed and this little girl stood up and started sniffing from the mortuary. That person is married now. Maurice Cyril and the other people have given testimony to the effect so many times. That's the first time I saw the dead raised. And then three other times where they had brought these witch doctors and they had brought their things that were burning them and this woman comes out and, uh, and uh, she had come to destroy us. The number one witch doctor, witch, witch in Uganda. She had come to destroy us, and as she came in the, build, the, the, the room, a, the snake right came out of her. Big snake. So in the name of Jesus, she fell back. The snake went back. She said, you see that hand there? That snake beat you. She said, yes, I had not fed it. Why are you here to destroy you? We gave her three days to go and bring all her witch, witchcraft things and so on, and we pray for her and we shave her head, because the Bible says, let the witch not live, stony them in the Old Testament, right? But we live under grace. We live under grace. We said, bring them, we we'll pray and shave your head and pray over you. She brought in those things. We burned them. Very little thing they burned for three, four days. Burning up. So the Lord was working. The reason why God was working like that is because in 1978, he sent a, young, a, a, a man.
And the reason why I left my, part, my testimony a little bit to come to this is because I wanted to show you my connection with you. Yes. Through not only Marina Glory, but through Israel. Yes. Not only that did, that did that happen, but my own niece, a nurse, she's a girl who fell on the body, the, the, on, the, on, on, on held Dora Brock. Dora Block. Block. The lady who was left in Uganda doing the rescue and she was killed. She could not want to let Uganda, I mean, soldiers to take that woman. She lost her life trying to protect this Jewish woman. Ah. They took her. They killed Dora in Uganda and dumped her body somewhere in the banana plantains. But because my niece had seen, she was a nurse who nursed her to try to get the bone, fish bone from her throat. Because she had already also was, you know, being tortured and asked why she did that, why she supporting Jews. Our other cousin went and monitored and they saw where the body was thrown. Oh. When Benjamin Netanyahu came to Uganda to retrieve the body of Dora Brock, it's my cousin who had the honor to tell them, to tell them where the body was. Oh my. That so I have a lot to do with Israel. Yes. By that time I was not in Uganda, I was in America. Because I, had es I escaped. That day, when they, they beat me, the reason the soldiers beat me when I had come from, Entebbe, from, from Canada and the French were in, the Israelis were in Entebbe, is because I was accused of helping Israelis to escape. Oh. They said, the Israelis came with C-130 planes, and you have just come from America, and last night you are saying that if we don't protect them, and this is what I told the soldier before he began beating me, if you don't protect them, God can close the eyes of the Arabs and he takes them out of there by his spirit and takes them back to Israel. Those are were, were my very words. Even if you don't protect them, God will close the eyes of the Arabs and he can get them by his spirit and take them back to Israel. Four hours later, this brother who was preached here, who preached here last night, his father's plan was in operation in Uganda. Yes, his father's plan. Colonel Yehuda Levy. Yehud talked to Idi Amin, say, hello, Amin, how are you doing? After they had rescued the hostages. <laughs> he did. Yes. <laughs> and remember, Idi Amin was saying, oh, Yehud is my friend, Yehud is my friend, when, 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 when the hostages were there. And Four hours later, after telling the, the, the Ugandan soldiers that God will close the Arabs' eyes and he will take them by his spirit, the 136 uh, Israelis back to Israel, the Israelis came with C-130s yes. and rescued their hostages. Yes. Saturday night. Sunday morning, as I prepared to go to church, the soldiers surrounded my house. You must be the one who brought them in and showed them where the hostages were. Wow. Now, listen to how God intervenes in the affairs of men. My neighbor was Idi Amin's driver. He's the one who used to drive me to the White House to teach the children. When he saw these soldiers surrounding me, and they were very angry. At that time, everyone who was associated with Israel was dead. And they now accusing me of having helped Israel to escape. My, but I had been, every time I traveled overseas, every time I got a dollar, I gave this soldier some money. He came and said, give him to me, I'm taking him to the president. He wants him personally. So the soldiers handed me to, this, this, to, to the, the driver, and the driver drove me out and said, get out of this country, they were going to kill you. I mean, his own soldier rescued me. So here I am in Kenya trying to figure out what to do. And when I was in America going to, to, to Vancouver, I had met Andre Crouch. So I called him and said, I need to come to America. Can you sponsor me? Can you get me a fidelity of support? Andre Crouch writes that he'll take care of me during my stay, and the embassy gives me a visa. I, I went to California. Running away from Idi Amin, and they were looking for me in Uganda seriously. And I was hiding in California. I came in 1976, November. And while I was there, hiding, fearing, not knowing what, not what to do, I heard 
that T.L. Osborne, T.L. Osborne is very famous in Africa. Yes. I heard he's preaching at the Satellite of the Spirit, the very first one, the very first convention, Satellite of the Spirit at Meloded and the Christian Center. And I wanted to go and listen to Brother T.L. Osborne to get some, because I was devastated, I was just, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to go back to Africa so much. I wanted to see the action of the Holy Spirit moving. I didn't want all these things talking. I don't see action in this. I don't see demons cast out. Yeah. I don't see anything. And at oh. one church I went to, they told me, and they're talking about demons and warning about it. They said, a pastor came and told me, you are scaring our children. He came and moved the microphone. You are scaring our children. We don't want this stuff in our, in our country. I'm sorry. We don't, I don't, I'm not going to let you preach again. Our country has no demons. The demons are in Africa. <laughs> That's how much I was humbled. The pastor forgot that every time if there were no demons in America, every time missionaries went there, they came with some on the planes. <laughs> and they didn't know how to deal with them. Yeah, they don't know how to deal with them. A lot of times I've been called in you know, Oklahoma by these um, breeders, girls who are bearing children so they can sacrifice to demons in, a yeah. in Oklahoma yeah. here. Satanic worship. Satanic worship in America. It's happening in America. But in 1978, 76, I came to America and I had it for one year and six months. And I got to listen to T.L. Osborne. And when I was there, a man comes in and said, who are you? He says, I know you. I know you. I said, huh, I know you. You are the one. Now, the first reaction was I wanted to run away because I knew Idi Amin was looking for me. And that's the time when the Nigerian government had hired people in Europe to put a, to put a diplomat in a, a box and, and, and they, they injected him with something. To, and then they, they, they put him in a, a box and marked it, diplomatic bag, and they were shipping him back to Nigeria to be assassinated, killed yeah. in England. And I was, so I was hiding. Idi Amin could do the same thing. Yeah. Look for me. So anyway, I said, who did? Who, um, he said, I met you. Are you not? Are you, I've, I've seen you somewhere. Well, have, you, have I seen you? I said to him, well, I'm from Uganda. He said, is your father against Christians? He said, no, my president he is. But I've seen you. I said, yes, I've also seen you. Are you the man who came in in my village a few years ago, 10 years ago, and uh, you look like him, you know. I, 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 his, him, his facial image remained on me. Because every time a white man comes in our village, even up to today, they have to come only by vehicles, by a car, and you hear it. But the way, the way this man came from the grasses this way in the dew, uh, that was about 6 in the morning, and by 6 in the morning it is still dark. And that's the first time, that's the time when we, uncle is trying to train me in the earliest things of witchcraft. So my uncle is training me, telling me about things, a lot of people in the tribe around, and here comes a white man and began talking, and immediately my uncle tells me to get in the, room, in the room building. But I stood in the corner of the house to hear him talk through another person who spoke English. And um, at 16, I'm, of course, being trained, I'm sacred, I'm not supposed to run around with things here and there. And so the man goes, I see uncle do his magic thing there with a stick. We call it the stick of God of the reptiles. Throws it down. And this man says something, and then he, the stick becomes no more because the stick was supposed to kill him. Oh, the, stick the snake was supposed to kill him. Uh -huh. The powers of Satan causes the stick to become, or the Satan comes through the stick and kills uh -huh. the, and, and has somebody and then goes back in the stick. That was a powerful magic stick in my family. Uh -huh. And immediately the thing comes back in the stick and the uncle tries to catch it and he doesn't touch it. So the people of the tribe want to stone this guy uh -huh. because he had interfered with our, our gods. Yeah. Right. So I ran through the back part to find out where his car is so that I can wait there to talk to him because I spoke English. So the, the, the man comes and I said, you, young man, God has sent me here to tell you about Jesus, that through your salvation, you save not only your people, your tribe, but you who use you all over the world. Yeah. Oh, <coughs> he, he prophesied yeah. to you. And I said, uh, where is the car? Where is the car you use? Where? I said, I didn't use the car. And the people in the tribe are coming, and I feared, so I ran back to, so they don't see me. I'll be talking to the white man. That was the end of the story. 
and I could listen, no, no cave, sound, nothing. Then when they came back, they said, well, he just disappeared. And you see in, Af in Africa, when you are hunting a buffalo, it's easier to hunt an elephant, I mean a lion, or a tiger, or something. It's easier, it's better than a buffalo. Buffaloes are very mean. <laughs> so that's where you do a lot of war, war, war dance before you, you, you can go to hunt a buffalo, because they will come after you. And there's this medicine we drink. So when you spear the buffalo, you begin running away, and then you disappear. Then you see the buffalo stops and begin looking, and you are there looking at it, because the medicine makes you disappear. Huh. And then another person spears it from behind and turns around and chases him. He also disappears. The buffalo stops and looks until the buffalo is killed within a very short area. So we've seen, we've seen miracles from the devil too. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, here I am. They said, oh, when he came, this white man, he just, he just disappeared. As we tried to chase him, he disappeared. But I just didn't pay attention to that. I just forget it. Ten years later, at Maryland Christian Center, so, are you the one who said, yeah? When I told him, did you come to my village? And this and this happened, he said, stop talking. He stopped me from talking. He pulled out his wallet and put in my hand the first $100 bill I ever saw. <laughs> and he also gave me a bio point pen and said, here my address. No, no, no. He just simply said, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, come to the hotel there. I want to call a few of my friends and my family so that they can hear the story. Oh. Oh. So here I go to my little place I was renting. And by the way, I was also broke. I didn't have anything. And I am a very funny man. When, even if I'm starving, I never, my, my wife will tell you I never ask. And that's stupid, foolishness. <laughs> it is foolishness because knowing that the Sister Billy Brown Ministries is going to pay for my hotel bill and so on. And I just drove here. I forgot to ask my wife to give me some money. They just filled the tank with the gasoline, and I drove here with no cent. So when I went to sign, they called me and said, you have to, I had $20. They said, you have to come and pay for your meals. I said, I was told I'm supposed to be fed here. And so I said, no, you have to be. And uh, I never told you. So I, for a whole, almost two days, I never ate a thing. Here? Yes. <laughs> Until Marilyn came yesterday and fed me. <laughs> shouldn't have happened. Happened it, at the desk. It yeah. was my fault, believe it or not. I've had it happen to me too. No, it was my fault. And you got the I never told them. They called, they told me, tell, me, tell uh, Taylor, Joan Taylor yeah. to come and tell us. Yeah. I never told her. Well, okay, or you would have been fed, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I learned my lesson last night. How will God meet your needs if you don't tell them? That's you right. give and give and give and give and give. How shall men give unto you flowing over if you don't tell them? That's right. So I said, oh Lord, I started for, started for almost two days among the saints of God. <laughs> we never grow. <laughs> But anyway, I gave that as testimony that please don't starve in the families of God. Ask, they'll give you. Ask. Yes. Tell them, hey, put my bill, go and ask them to write the, the thing for me. I'm, I'm starving. You don't keep quiet and starve. That is foolishness. I repented my foolishness. Sister, forgive me. I forgive you. Amen. <laughs> I've done it myself. I've checked into hotels and you're there to speak. And they tell you at the desk, everything is covered but your meals and phone calls or something. So I just give them my credit card and get it. That, 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 the one would give a credit card. I told them, do you want a, a monkey card? I don't have a credit card. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't know what a monkey card is, so I left them. <laughs> His wife wasn't here with the cards yet. It is easier, it is easier to starve than to give a monkey card anyway. A so, monkey card? <laughs> after all, we, we fast for... Three, four, five, forty days. We fast without we fast without food in Africa. So two, three days wouldn't kill me. <laughs> anyway, Al told me to come, and at two o'clock that afternoon at Maryland, he said, "Joe, tell the people what happened on that day when I came, when you saw me in your village. I have not told them anything. 
So he said, I have not, uh, Joe has not talked to me at all about the details, but this is what happened. He told them his story before I came in. So he said, okay, now you tell. That's why he told me to come at 2 o'clock, because he wanted to talk to them first. So he told them his experience. He wanted the story to be collaborated by independent person. So he calls me in, and I come and tell the story as a testimony. And he's, then he stood up and said, Joe, I want to tell you, I was never in your place in the physical. Do you know the story of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip? I said, yes. So that's exactly what happened between you and I. I never have been in Uganda. I looked at him with this um, charismatic surprise. <laughs> Were you there? And I said, uh, what? By the way, somebody on the road around there, is there a, a, a brown bag, a zipper there? Under the shed, big, big business-like file under there, around where your sister already is, around the seats there, around there. Is it there? I lost it. I left it there last night. It's not. It's missing. I, I wanted. Uh, there are some things in it, and <laughs> if please find it for me because it is, it's it's my book. Uh, I'm writing a book, and it's my complete manuscript. I need it. Oh, I'm sure we have it. We'll and then. So he, I, I was, I, I, I just, he said, I know you will not believe what I'm telling you. I was not there in the spirit. I really did not believe him. I thought this is another American who is crazy with their big speeches. I did believe our willer. He said, because God is telling me you are not believing, he just told me to tell you this. In seven days, no, in 10 days, this was Sunday. At 2 30 to 45. In its 10 days, you'll be sitting and eating with Idi Amin. Oh. That's a sign to show you that I was translated in the Holy Spirit, brought to your country to bring you the good news that you should be a preacher. Are you a preacher? I said, Yes, I am. He said, Yes, God says in 10 days you'll be sitting and eating with Idi Amin. Now I'm hiding from Idi Amin. I'm accused of helping these Israelis. I'm a wanted man on the Amini's shoot on f at first sight. You is telling me I'm going to be sitting with the Idi Amin? I said, oh, okay, let's pray. He prayed. I said, Brother Joe, goodbye. Here is my PowerPoint pen, my address, and my phone. When you come back from Uganda after 10 days, call me. Oh, my goodness. And he left. He said, we are going. They drove off to the airport. I thought about it, and uh, this is one of the things you quickly put away. Who, who, how, uh, how shall I get in Uganda? I'm broke. I don't have anything. Who will take me to Uganda? After all, but I had just come from the from Mojave Desert. I'd been on a 40-day fast. You know, you go to the desert, you take no food, nothing except some water. I went to fast for 40 days so that somebody can go to preach to Idi Amin. Africans do foolish things like that. <laughs> but we are, we are foolish for Jesus. So here I am, quiet. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the last day of the, of the conference of Satellite of the Spirit. I go to Maryland Christian Center to see if I could get one person who can go and preach to Idi Amin. And I'm standing there, and here comes Chico Holiday and Mike Dabney and some other people. Say, how are you? Where? I, had, I had my cans on, the long African garment. I wore and I said, where you come from? Where do you come from? Do you know Benson Ada House? I said, yeah, he's my brother. We preach together. I said, um, I have come here to look for somebody to go and preach to Idi Amin. I said, oh, Dr. Wilkerson has been with um, uh, the Prime Minister of, England, of, of, of Israel and with Sadat. Sadat. He preached to them. He could go and preach to Idi Amin. I said, oh, yeah, could he please? So, yeah, he, he's coming. Here he is coming. You talk to him. Bro, God brought Ralph Wilkerson at the divine time, and he just walked right around me. I said, sir, can you go and preach to Idi Amin? <laughs> and he said, go and make arrangements for us to go and preach to Idi Amin. Yeah. So, thank you very much. They found it. And the key is also... 
for my car. So, for somebody's car. So anyway, they... They told me, okay, go and arrange it, make a, because you know, I was, I told Idi Amin when he became president in 1971, I was already a school teacher from University of Cambridge, England. So they called me to come and teach Idi Amin how to read and write. I was Amin's first teacher when he became a president. <laughs> so here I'm teaching and John, and he brought himself uh, an English man, uh, Bob Assos, <laughs> to teach him. So they made me the teacher for his children. And I taught a bunch of them. And uh, so he, I, I, I knew I had his phone number, his phone number. So I tried to call, but they had changed his phone number. They changed the phone number with Yamin every week. And I didn't know. So I told the post office people in the post office, they, that was where the exchange was, the telephone exchange is. I said, I want to talk to the president. He said, but who are you? I said, don't ask me, because I know how, I know how soldiers talk in Africa. I knew how they, don't ask me. If you, if you, don't, if you don't answer me, I'll, I'll have your family disappear. <laughs> <laughs> they knew what that means. So he said, okay, hold, but the number is, is, he gave me the number. I said, then why didn't you connect me? So if you knew him, why, didn't you, why did you not have the right number? I said, one more sentence and your family will disappear. <laughs> so they gave me the number. They, they, they put me through the switch. And uh, I hear the first person who came on the phone was my uncle, uh, who, who was a colonel, Colonel Ibrahim, a Muslim. The only, and because they became Muslim, they were kicked from the family. When you became Muslim, you were kicked away from the Christian families. There we separate Christian and Islam. They are enemies. Here in America, oh, it's freedom of religion. <laughs> freedom of religion when you are killing people. Thank God for Bush. I immediately was connected with Yamin, and in a few minutes or so, I hear a voice, hello, says, oh, your excellency, yes, who is this, Mualim, Mualim means teacher, hey, Mualim, where are you, said, I'm in America, in America, yeah, what are you doing in America, said, well, I'm in school, <laughs> I'm in school, what are you studying, economics, oh, what is it, I said, you, I have some, a man of God to come and tell you about Jesus, he said, oh, okay, my mother was a Christian, which is true. My mother was a Christian. She told me about Jesus all the time. When does he want to come? And Wilkerson said, they were all listening in the phone. They were all listening. Were about four, five, six people were listening in. And, um, and some of them were almost fainting, you know. <laughs> some of them were so shocked they were bleaching whiter than this one. So, <laughs> you know, brother... These white people don't know. <laughs> Only an African can say that. A black man cannot say that. <laughs> These white people don't know that the first man was black. From clay, dirt. <laughs> and so God, Yahweh, God dust made a man, black man, and he just even put a rib from a black man, make a black, made a black woman. Yeah. <laughs> and the Bible says in the evening, God could come and talk to Adam. That's why we black people are cool, man. <laughs> it's in the Bible, it's in the Bible. And so, when Adam and Eve listened to the devil and disobeyed, <laughs> some of you know the story because I've told it many times in some places. When they heard, said, Adam, where are you? They were so scared they bleached white. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it.
about it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I may have no wife this afternoon. No, 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 no. That's not true. That's not true. You know, you see? My palms are almost white. My daughter, just before I close and possibly say a prayer, if you allow me. Yes. I will ask my daughter and son to come and bless in a song, and then I'll pray over you. Yes. If you don't mind. Yes, we, it's a prayer conference, yes. My daughter recently, most recently, has for the first time so under my feet. I said, Daddy, what happened to your feet? What happened to your feet? <laughs> because they're white. You know why? Because Adam and Eve were actually white. I'm serious. And the devil came behind them and, and came to them and said, Adam, Adam, look at that tree. It's wonderful. So oh, God told her, they told the story. And, 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 and um, so somehow... When Adam and Eve listened to the devil to look around, and they said, when they saw the tree, they actually began touching it like this. And as they did that, the devil came and sprayed them black. That's why our hands and feet are white. <laughs> the paint could never get there. It is in the Bible. This time I will show you where it is. Do you want to see it? It is in the book of Romans. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. So whether you bleached white or whether you are painted black, you are a sinner. I tell you so. But God in Jesus Christ makes us one in him. That's right. That's right. And what happens that day is when I called and Idi Amin said, come to Uganda, I, that was Thursday. On Sunday morning, I was in Maryland testifying, talking about Uganda and so on. And a man of God has come among us. I was introduced and on Saturday, Sunday night, we were in, on the, in the New York and, the, and the Switzerland and the Kampala. We got in Uganda on Monday in the morning. They had to interrogate us because they didn't know whether we were CIA or not. But Mrs. Sister Wilkerson, Dr. Wilkerson's wife, is a cousin of Marilyn, Dor Marilyn Carter. Is it Marilyn Carter? Dos Ros Rosalind Carter. She's a cousin. So... When Idi Amin heard that, and he knew that Uganda had an embargo from the U.S., and he wanted it lifted so badly, he was able to receive Dr. Ralph Wilkerson. On Tuesday morning, 10 days later, I had forgotten about Alwila's prophecy. 10 days later, I was sitting with Idi Amin and eating. <laughs> At that moment, I knew Al was in Uganda. His testimony was true. You knew he was there, but you thought he had come in a car. I just believe, didn't believe that he was translated. I knew yeah. he was there. You knew he was there. I knew I saw him. Yeah. But his, this spiritual stuff that he was translated, forget it. <laughs> but it is true he was there. Because even if I doubted, he says, that says the Lord, in exactly 10 days, you'll be sitting and eating with Idi Amin. Goodbye. And he left. And so, when that took place, I knew the Lord had called me for his purposes. I began preaching with his strength all over California. I never hid anymore. I saw the dead healed, the, 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 the sick healed, and a lot of miracles taking place. I have been in all countries of the world proclaiming the gospel. But it is the foolishness of not being want to be in the front line and to tell the gospel with boldness. 
very hard for one to get me on the pulpit to preach. I usually don't like it because of the responsibility, spiritual responsibilities. Yes, it is, spiritual responsibility. It's a very big responsibility yes, to yes. hold the word of truth. I don't want to be abused. I don't want to abuse it. I don't want to insult God. And I've lived a life, my wife has wanted me to do this all the time, to go and minister. Somehow I did it, and the Lord wanted to show me more and more things. Give Jacqueline those papers and bring them to me. During my run, errands to run here and there, God told me, I give you a wife to marry. I was in Oklahoma. We had been praying with the sister Marilyn, and they were good friends. Al had died. When Al died, they left his body in the mortuary for a few days, waiting for me to come and raise him from the dead. But I didn't know he was there. He was dead. It was nine months later until I came back. Believe it or not, if I had known when he got that accident, I would have not left that mortuary until I see him. I, I loved the man. I knew the man. And when I saw Brother Copeland, he looks a little bit like Lady Al. <laughs> Yes, they do them so much. I, so it was so, so wonderful, so wonderful, darling. Um, I was there and I, I was so devastated for Arrow's death because, I, you know, I, I, the things were so good that I had said. And I know when the Lord came to me that day and said, I'm giving you a wife for a purpose. This is a very difficult country. I've anointed you and called you, but it will be hard. Because I'm giving you this woman for the healing of the church. You need to know I was a racist person. I never believed that God made a white man to marry a black woman. And vice versa. I said if he wanted them that way he would have dared it so. He has a spiritual mind trying to be so funny. And I began praying against it. And my father-in-law was a good friend of mine. And we began praying and fasting against it. <laughs> because God had told me that his daughter would be my wife. Wow. And the family said, yeah, God has actually told us so. But my father you know, said, but I have, as a father, I have a right to say no. I said, yay, man, let's pray. <laughs> but I, I didn't believe in it. After all, to mess up my ministry. I'm being candid. That's how racist we are. Black or white. If God tells you to do something, you say, oh no, that doesn't happen like that. We don't do things like that in America. We have God on the clock. We must finish by a certain hour. And the Holy Spirit is still enjoying and would like to come and bless you. You're already going for your lunch. That's why you miss out. That's right. It's truth. You put God on the clock. Thank God you don't do it here. Thank God for this place. You don't do it here. You worship God. Thank you for the ministry. So bear with me. I've taken a little bit of time, your time. Bear with me. I must say what I have to say. 